instead, Mr. Harville had like turned the lights off in the room on the first day and then like put a flashlight in his face and he was like, murder created the world you're in. I would have been like, what? And I would have really been engaged with American history because the actual history of America is bonkers. There's a theatrical buzz going on around town. Why? Master storyteller Mike Daisy has returned to Seattle with his new show, A People's History. And joining me is the master himself, Mr. Daisy. So nice to see you. It's nice to be seen. Well, welcome back to Seattle. Now, before we launch into the new show, um, I wanted to give our viewers just a little context of kind of who you are, because you've got a big reputation. Uh, and you, your career kind of began in Seattle. 2001 was 21 dog years, right? Yes. And that was about your time at Amazon? Yes. Okay. And that was that kind of the leaping off point for you where you realized this is what I want to do? Yes, it really was. Yeah. Um, I'd uh, always wanted to work in the theater and mm -hmm. I'd always been very interested in writing and I wanted to find a way to uh, create a form where those things could, could live together on stage and that's where it really started was with that show. And so since that point, you've written, I think it's close to 30 monologues and plays. You've performed around the globe, which brings us to this table and the new show, um, A People's History. So what is this new show about? Well, big question. it is a big question. Yeah. But, uh, fundamentally, this show is about uh, American history, mm -hmm. and it's about all of American history, mm -hmm. which is a large topic. Mm -hmm. And you kind of have to pick where to begin and end. So this is a show where I start in October on a, on a, on a crisp day in 1492, and I go all the way to 2018, huh. the present moment. Mm -hmm. So because of that, instead of trying to do all of that in like 90 minutes yeah. and then we get a coffee, which if I could pull that off, I totally would. Yeah. There's so much story to tell that it's in 18 parts. There are 18 chapters. Right. And so the whole yeah. show is actually about 30 hours long. But if you come to see it, yeah. It's about 90 minutes long because you'll see one part of our entire American history. And, and so, and how did you, well, I want to talk about the monologues, but how did you start this? What was the, you put a couple things together to even start writing this piece, which was, I believe, your, your high school or uh, history book? Yeah, yeah, I read a bunch of things, but the, the show is made out of two books. Mm -hmm. And one book is Howard Zinn's A People's History of the United States, which mm -hmm. is a history book that's kind of like uh, the inverse negative of a normal history book in that it focuses on all the people mm -hmm. in history that we don't talk about. Mm -hmm. So it focuses on the poor, women, people of color, uh, LGBTQ people, all these uh, groups mm -hmm. that traditionally when we tell American history, we focus very specifically on people who look pretty much like me, right. you know, right, straight right. white men. Right. And so uh, what I was really interested in is how Zinn shows the same history but how many things we've, we've left out and not illuminated. And then the book I put next to it, which made a lot of sense, is I went on eBay mm -hmm. and I found my actual US history book that I was taught US history from when I was in high school in rural Maine yeah. uh, a long time ago. And so that becomes the other book yeah. that I'm comparing what they both say about what history is. These two continents were incredibly full of people. They were not vast, open, unexplored spaces that you know, had nothing in them. The only way you could imagine that is if you were like, I want to take these spaces. And it's awkward if there are people here. <laughs> so if I'm going to write about it so other people read it, maybe I could write about it where I just kind of erase them so they're not there. So you get like a great mythology of like the boundless, endless vistas of the West. Oh, there's some race. Get those people out of there. And then it's nice and empty. So then, you know, white people can just like go there. When you were going through all this material, did you, what did you learn about U.S. history that you had no idea? Is there anything that really like, wow, that, that's something I didn't, I didn't know? Oh, so many things. Some of them because they're so, they're so small and clear and chilling. And some of them, uh, because myth, the mythology of them mm. has been changed to the opposite direction. Like the best short example would be that 
we talk about George Washington as the father of our country, right. uh, which is true, he was the first president. And then we talk about him as being uh, always, never telling a lie, mm -hmm. which uh, is actually kind of true mm -hmm. in that he was not a very clever, he was not known for his like verbal acuity. Uh -huh. So he may have never told a lie because he's kind of always very straightforward. And um, he also had wooden teeth, mm -hmm. is what we're taught. I know all those things. <clears throat> right, uh, except that they weren't wooden teeth. Huh? And that's not a secret history. We knew the whole time huh? because we had letters from him to his dentists and we actually have his dentures that what he actually wore were dentures made out of his slaves' teeth, which he had extracted from his slaves' mouths while they were alive, made into dentures and wore them in his mouth. Oh my God. Yeah. Oh my God. That's stunning. Mm -hmm. So there's more of that. Yes. Uh, eventually, through incredible, hard, difficult, vicious effort, um, black Americans finally made their way into upper education. And some of them actually chose for reasons that can't even, but why would they do this? Some of them finally were driven and compelled to become historians, and then they went into the same rooms that their white brethren had been going into for centuries, and they looked at the books and they said, wait a minute, we should tell this story. And you can imagine, how much pushback there was. There was a lot. Why this show now? Is this show now because of what's going on politically in our country? It's partly because of that. Mm -hmm. I actually started working on it about three years ago. Mm -hmm. So it didn't start that way. Mm -hmm. But I will say that the atmosphere we live in mm -hmm. makes the show really necessary and really important. Because um, for me, it's one of the few things that makes me feel better about where we're at. Mm -hmm. And it makes you feel better about where we live now um, in a different way than you expect. Instead of telling you that everything is going to be okay and that um, and things aren't so bad, the show and its stories sort of grind away at this mythology mm -hmm. of everything always having been perfect. Mm -hmm. So then when you see what American history was really like for most of the people in it, the majority of the people didn't look like me. Mm -hmm. The majority of people were women who couldn't vote until very recently, uh, where black people were kept as property and slaves and then still not really free mm -hmm. until, uh, until the, the, not that many decades ago and then, and then fully uh, today still suffer intense racism. Mm -hmm. um, when you actually consider all of that, mm -hmm. what 2018 looks like makes a lot more sense. Changes the context. Yeah, it makes yeah. it make sense. Like, yeah. history actually has a coherent thread, mm -hmm. and I feel like that's one of the arguments for why this mm -hmm. kind of history is better for us mm -hmm. and makes a better guide to what history, what life has been like, because you can see that it follows. Like, like when you look at the news in the morning, mm -hmm. it makes sense with this history. Right, right. One of the through lines of all those people who signed the declaration, they're actually all immense landowners most of whom had tremendous slave populations, and all of them had a ton of money. And so they were all, surprise, surprise, deeply interested in how much they were being taxed. See, these were the people that were very passionate about that. And it became a great wedge issue, something that could unify them. They were like, you know, if we could just give an enormous tax break to the richest people and then gut the system entirely, we could do whatever the we wanted. We just need to get rid of some people. And I honestly can't even tell you if what I just said was about 2018 or 1776. The 18 different monologues, that's a lot of words and storylines to remember. Do you ever go off, ever forget where you are, or get kind of lost, or you know, kind of veer off? What, does that happen? Um, yeah, a little bit. It's I mean, you, you hope you're good enough at your job yeah. at this point. Yeah. I've been doing this for a couple of decades. Yeah. You hope you're good enough at your job that you yourself know mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. you're in the weeds. Mm -hmm. Hopefully they don't know you're in the weeds. They probably don't. You know, well, they usually don't because that's the whole reason to work on something so much yes. is so that even when you have screwed it up, yes. they don't actually know it's screwed up because they don't know it would have been even better. Right. And so you go off stage and you're like, oh, that was, I was, oh. And usually, you know what the problem is? It's always something like, 
I should have eaten dinner a little bit later. <laughs> like, I should have tracked out my blood sugar. Like, the problem is never like... Now I just want to sleep. No, no, yeah. it's always like, you know, last night there was that noise and the yeah. vent, it was, and then I didn't get enough sleep, and that's where we are now. Right. And right. now I'm not properly talking about this labor uprising. Right, right, um, right. But, uh, uh, but no, no. Other you, than that, you don't, you don't kind of lose your way normally with words, or with, with the lines. You, not you just, generally, just, no. Just stay with it. No, not right. generally. And part of that is it's really like running a marathon. Mm -hmm. I probably would if I didn't review everything. Mm -hmm. But because of the way this works, because each show is completely new, mm -hmm. I myself, on the day of each show, sit down with all of my notes hmm. and the original chapter. I often reread the original chapters from the Zin again. Hmm. I listen to recordings of myself having done it hmm. in the past, um, and then I reload it and get ready to do a version of it for that night. Yeah. If I didn't do any of that work, I would get lost you're right. all the time. Well, you're, you're, <laughs> you're, yeah, you're, you're doing all the footwork all yeah. the time. Um, so I just want to mention, because I'm curious on, on how, how this has gone for you since that controversy in 2010 with the Steve Jobs Apple thing. That was about artistic license as a storyteller, right, and journalistic, being a journalist factual. Um, mm -hmm. right? So how did you weather that controversy? Because I think you handled it well. And how did it, or did it, affect how you've gone forward and how you have written your work? Well, it affects everything in the sense that it becomes part of the matrix of, of things that everybody talks about. Right. Like, right. like it affects your life because it becomes part of the story of, of who you are and what you're doing. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of it becomes, is very helpful because one thing it clarifies with a bright line is that I am a storyteller. Yeah. So like you don't actually have to now worry going forward that people do not understand Mm -hmm. that you are a storyteller that tells stories. If yeah. people don't understand that, mm -hmm. then they're really not paying attention. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. so that's actually been really liberating mm -hmm. because it sort of frees me. So it's funny because people would sort of think you'd be more trapped, but I actually feel freer. Mm -hmm. And one of the reasons I feel freer is that the facts of every labor story I ever told about, about Apple, uh, about Steve Jobs, were all completely true. Mm -hmm. Every single part of that story was based on 10 years of human rights reports mm -hmm. that I meticulously researched. Mm -hmm. I mean, the reason that they were so resonant and the show was so good is I relied on the work of journalists and activists who had done all that work. Right. It was my job as a dramatist to put them to together. To weave it together, right. So, right. Um, right. yeah, I've always depended on all these people to mm -hmm. have done like all the heavy lifting. Mm -hmm. uh, and then it's my job to look for ways to connect it up to create empathy. Mm -hmm. So having it clearer that I'm not a journalist, mm -hmm. which I never wanted to be. You and never I'm, said you were. I'm not, I, I have no intention <laughs> of transitioning to journalism now. Yeah. Um, no, I, I, I feel like it's good that way. Yeah. I feel like it really clarifies what my mm -hmm. role is in the culture. Mm -hmm. And then that allows me to A lot to of be, freedom. Yeah, and it allows me to be clearer in, about who and what it is I want to talk about. Right. You know, and then we... Uh, uh, and, and I like, in a way, in our modern age, it's funny, it's been so many years now, but now as we sit in 2018, you know, we fight about what the nature of truth is constantly. Mm -hmm. And so it's actually a very important role to be a monologist who's been through the fire of those kind of controversies to say that, no, no, there is something called the facts and those are vitally, utterly important. There's also the truth. And the truth is built out of which facts you accept and like what story you're choosing to tell. And in a lot of ways, this narrative of this whole history mm -hmm. is a way of showing that we are all taught all these facts and many of the facts we're taught in school are completely true. Mm -hmm. They're just not every fact. And all the facts about women, George Washington's teeth, mm -hmm. all these resonant details are left out. Mm -hmm. So then we paint a certain picture. Mm -hmm. And you need to like look for those complexities mm -hmm. or you're never actually going to be able to, um, to create a society where we can actually have a real dialogue. Mm -hmm. you, injustice is a driver for you, obviously. And you, you seem to look out for the little guy. Would you say that would be an inaccurate? Yeah, I feel like I, I grew up in a, a rural, poor place, and I think that I'm really, um, I have a tendency to be uh, very sympathetic to people who, um, who, are, who come from less. Mm -hmm. And, um, and, and I'm, I'm very sympathetic to workers. I myself make a living literally by telling the story on stage, mm -hmm. different stories. I, I, like, I'm, I am a laborer. Yeah. I do all right. right. But I mean, I'm, I, I, I have a lot of sympathy for labor and for, um, and for, and for people who come from less, yeah. 
Are you pessimistic or optimistic about the future? I'm, um, I'm a big believer in existentialism, and so I feel like the whole idea of existentialism is that the world doesn't have inherent meaning. Mm -hmm. And I feel like that's very true here in 2018. I think that existentialism should be on the rise because the whole reason existentialism isn't nihilism, where you just decide it doesn't matter, is that existentialism is the grappling with the idea that even though things don't make sense and are often horrific, we owe it to the human spirit to make it make sense. Mm -hmm. So that's a roundabout way of saying that I am pessimistic, but I am dedicated to the proposition that we have to work even harder, mm -hmm. even as things darken. Mm -hmm. What would you hope the audience takes away from your uh, people's history? I would hope that it engenders conversations where it sort of wakes them up mm -hmm. and it makes them consider. Mm -hmm. um, the thing I most hope is that it makes them go out and read and think more about the stories they hear every day in the news and in the world and like make them want to dig deeper and contrast those stories with, with other stories. We've had a couple of people there. There's a, a two people, I met them in the lobby, the, uh, uh, older, older uh, white lady and a slightly younger uh, black woman who have met at the shows and they started coming and because the show is in these many parts they come repeatedly oh, wow. and so they were like we're friends now they told me we've been coming we've come like four or five of them and uh, I took a picture of them in the lobby they're very they're very happy and I was outside I was waiting for my for a car to come and they were next to me and I've just done all these shows and they've watched me for all these hours yes. they had nothing to say to me because they were busy <laughs> talking to each other about the nature of gentrification in Seattle which I hadn't been talking about but connects into all these labor things yeah. I've been discussing and they got so excited and the car pulled up and I'm getting in and one of them said we, we just ignored you we were so busy talking about like what does it mean to be in Seattle and the things that are changing yeah. and I was like that's perfect perfect that's exactly <laughs> right you made my night take good care night. good oh. night and so yeah it's it's nice like that's the kind of thing yeah, it's beautiful. you're hoping for yeah right well I'm so happy that you're back in Seattle and you're, you are truly a masterful uh, storyteller. Uh, a People's History written and performed by Mike Daisy runs now through November 25th in the Leo K Theater at Seattle Rep. And like we've been saying, 18 monologues, you come a lot of different nights, you're going to see different things, so get your tickets. Thank you so much. Thanks for what? having me. Yeah, absolutely delightful. <laughs> Cheers. Cheers. To the brain. Oh. To the brain. To the brain. To the and brain. the heart. And the heart. Mm-hmm.